For our final reading this semester, we have Ted Chang's The Story of Your Life. This story is a very complex one, and it's also the foundation for the movie Arrival, which came out a couple years ago. I was really shocked to learn that they were making a movie out of Story of Your Life, and I did go see Arrival and I, I enjoyed it, but before I saw it, I was very confused. How could you possibly make a Hollywood blockbuster out of this story? Because the actual action of the story is just people sitting in a room talking to aliens who are also sitting in a room on a spaceship. The movie supplemented some of the complexity that Ted Chang adds to the story to make it interesting. They supplemented it with action. And of course, that's sort of the move that a movie has to make. But as much as I liked Arrival, I really prefer the story, and I bet that you will too if you've seen the movie. The story is really terrific. Ted Chang based this story on a few theories and concepts. So rather than talk a lot about the character plot and those elements of the story, I thought I would address some of the concepts that Ted Chang uses here and maybe that'll help you enhance your understanding of the story while you read it or if you've already read it. So the first concept that we'll talk about is non-linear time. In this story, there are aliens from another part of the universe, the heptapods, and they have arrived around Earth and they're trying to communicate with us. And one of the things that we learn about them is that they experience time differently than we do. We say that our experience of time is linear, meaning that it goes from one moment to the next and it always moves in a particular direction. We experience time that way, perhaps because of the way that we've evolved, the way that our senses are arranged, something about our physical being and our awareness of the universe may dictate our perception of time. And the concept of an alien species understanding time differently is not unique to this story. The most famous other example of this is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, where the Tralfalmagorians uh, kidnap Billy Pilgrim, and the Tralfalmagorians are aliens who experience time in a non-linear fashion, which then allows Billy Pilgrim to also experience time in a non-linear fashion. In this story, the heptapods allow two scientists who are responsible for communicating with them, uh, Luis Banks and Gary Donnelly, they allow those characters, or at least Louise, the ability to sort of detach from time and experience time in a non-linear fashion. So Louise is a, is a linguist and Gary is a physicist. And the two of them together are responsible for deciphering the aliens' communications. And we learn that the aliens have two different types of language. They have their spoken communication, which the story calls heptapod A, and they have their written communication, which the story calls Heptapod B. This moves us to our next concept that Ted Chang used to underwrite the plot of the story. And this concept is primarily associated with Louise because she's the linguist. And the concept I'm thinking of is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. This is a linguistic concept that says that our language dictates the structure of our thoughts. So, of course, we all live on the same planet, we are all the same species, and our experiences are dictated largely by our senses, so we have a lot of commonality in how we think and how we experience the world. It doesn't matter what culture you're from or what language you speak, you'll be thinking and experiencing a lot of the same things as other people here on Earth. But the language that you use, the language that you primarily speak in, your first language, or a language that you learn complete fluency in later, you are able to think in those languages. And because different languages have different grammatical structures and different syntax, the way that they construct thoughts are gonna be a little different, just like the way that they construct speech slightly differently. To give an example, sort of just off the top of my head, the only other language that I speak with any level of proficiency is Spanish. And in Spanish, there are different conjugations for someone's age or their, basically their formality in relation to you. So if someone is younger than you or you're just having an off-the-cuff conversation uh, with someone your own age or someone you know very well, a close acquaintance, you use the to form. You say, como estas? 
If you are meeting someone of importance or someone older or someone that you don't know that well, you might use the usted form, como esta. In English, we don't have this. We just say, how are you? We may add sir or ma'am or madam or something to the end of our statement, how are you, to denote some sort of level of uh, respect, but it's not embedded in our language the same way. It's kind of a small difference, but you can see how the having respect of that sort embedded in one language would sort of change the way that you think a little bit if you were thinking in one language to the next, if you were thinking in Spanish versus English. So in this story, learning heptapod is very different. It's not a slight variation. Like Spanish and English, we share cognates, we share grammatical things, we have many, many elements of our languages in common. We both have Latin as our one of our root languages. And so the languages are, are similar, but heptapod is something we could never even imagine. And the heptapod aliens, because they live in a different body, they have a different sensory spectrum, and they use a different language, their concept of time and causality, these things are very different. And so if you look up the sapir whorf hypothesis, that's one of the concepts that Ted Chang used to describe how Louise could think about time differently or think about time in a non-linear fashion. She learns a different language and the structure of that language changes the structure of her thoughts and allows her to have basically a different experience of time and her whole life. When we think about Gary, who's not quite as important a character in the story because he is not the narrator, Luis is the narrator, um, but they are co-parents in the story, as well as co-communicators with the heptapods. If you think about Gary, he has a concept in the story that's associated with him called Fermat's Principle. And I'm not going to try to explain Fermat's Principle to you in great detail. It's a concept from physics that explains how light moves. I don't know the math behind it, and I don't really know how to explain it other than to say that it's a theory or a concept, I should say a principle, not a theory, um, that notes that light takes the fastest path from point A to point B. It will take the path, not just of least resistance, but of shortest time. And this will change depending on what the light is passing through or what obstacles it encounters, but it'll always find the fastest way to its destination. So the heptapods, the way that they think, the way that they experience time, is also similar in the sense that Fermat's principle talks about how light works. Well, that's something in our uh, universe, something that we can measure with our mathematical capabilities, and that's something that we can write about and talk about that is different than how we generally see time progressing uh, you know, through events and obstacles and, you know, the way that we think time works. Light violates, basically light has principles that violate the way we generally think about time. So Ted Chang used these concepts to underwrite this story. And while you read it, I want you to be thinking about those two concepts. Maybe take a minute and look them up on Wikipedia. I've given you a brief description of how they work here, but even a Cursory read online will give you a lot more information than I've provided. So look up Fermat's principle, look up the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And in the end, I think what you'll find is that Ted Chang is a writer who can take concepts of staggering complexity and use them to support a plot and a conflict in a story that is beautiful and accessible, if maybe itself somewhat complex. I hope you enjoy this story. Watch Arrival after you read it if you have not seen that movie and see what you think. Um, and I look forward to reading what you have to say about it on the discussion board.